Buddy, I, I hate these lights in my eyes because I can't see the faces of everybody out there. Um, but I want to say good morning and welcome to our first official day of programming for this Congress. Uh, lots of bright, shiny faces this morning, so that's nice to see. Um, my co-chair and I, Rebecca Ludwig, have been working on this for, well, about a year and a half, and we were talking about the fact it's like planning a wedding, um, and it's like a wedding for a thousand people, a thousand people from 60 countries. So thank you for coming to our wedding. Um, the generosity of sponsors for this event has been unprecedented, and I just want to acknowledge Philips, one of our gold sponsors, who is sponsoring this plenary talk this morning. <laughs> It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce our plenary speaker, our keynote speaker, Dr. Alex Haddad. Alex is a very passionate man, and this man is on a mission, as you'll see during his talk. His mission is to eliminate unnecessary suffering and clear the path for a full life. He's passionate about joy and happiness and living life to its fullest, and, and you'll, he exudes it, and you'll see it soon. Alex was born and educated in Colombia, where he completed his medical studies, specializing in anesthesiology in 1986. After spending some time in Oxford University, as one does, uh, where he became one of the first physicians in the world to earn a doctorate in health knowledge synthesis, he came to Canada, lucky for us, in 1995, first to Hamilton's McMaster University. In 2000, we welcomed his arrival to the University of Toronto and the University Health Network, where he led the creation of the Center for Global eHealth, this magnificent facility. Global eHealth Innovation, a setting designed as a simulator for the future to study and optimize the use of information, communication technologies before their introduction into the health system and the society at large. Currently, he is the chief innovator and brains and founder of the Center for Global eHealth Innovation, and he's the Canada Research Chair in eHealth Innovation. His research and innovation work focuses on virtual tools to support the encounter between the public and the health system, interactive tools to pro promote knowledge translation and mentorship of health professionals and the public, and online resources to support social networks, to respond to major public health threats, to support international collaboration, and to enable the public to shape the healthcare system and society. So he's a busy man. And if he's not busy enough, in case you're worried that he takes too much time off, he's also spearheading the development of the Global People-Centered Health Innovation Network, a group of individuals, organizations, tools, and facilities working to promote research, development, education, policy, funding, recognition, and commercialization activities related to the use of ICTs to promote optimal levels of health and wellness. He also leads the People Health Equity and Innovation Group, PHI, at the University of Toronto, which focuses on efforts to level the playing field for disadvantaged members of society with emphasis on youth leadership development, supportive care, and the promotion of a culture of multiculturalism. Alex was recently honored as a pioneer for change in recognition of his extraordinary contributions to making diversity the cornerstone of what makes Canada a great nation. Alex has many other accomplishments that I could go on listing, but I think you'd probably rather listen to him this morning than to me. I will tell you that if you want to find Alex, he is on every possible social network that you can find. You can tweet him, you can Facebook him, you can find him on LinkedIn, you can find Alex almost everywhere. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Alex Haddad. And I am a hugger. I'm a hugger. I love hugs. And uh, especially in Canada. How many people here um, are coming from outside Canada? Outside North America? OK. How many of you hug still in your countries? OK, to the patients and people you are serving. Okay. Over here, over 80% of the interactions don't include human touch. So when I was invited to give this presentation, I couldn't resist the temptation. <laughs> I said, I'm going for it. Okay. And um, I love your program. I think you have done a magnificent job, full of gadgets and techniques and simulations and doses and protection from defects or radiation. Fantastic, wonderful. But I'm delighted to have the opportunity now, and I know that yesterday the award-winning uh, lecture was emphasizing the importance of the human touch. 
you have this, and at the end you're going to have another dose. So let's have a dance for about an hour together. Let's talk about some gadgets, but let's talk about love. And uh, I want to start with two of my superheroes. That man there died in 2002, my father. He was a physician. He smoked like a maniac. And in 1999, he calls me and he says, Alex, and he never called me. He said, I will be 60 in a few months, Alex. I said, yes, Dad, I know. I said, I'm calling you because I need um, a birthday present from you. Very weird. My dad would never call me or would never ask for a birthday present. And I said, OK, Dad. I was getting worried by that point. He said, I have cancer. I stopped smoking three years ago, but life sent me the bill. And I don't want treatment. But my friends keep offering me stuff. Okay. The clinical oncologist offered me chemotherapy. The radiation oncologist offered me radiotherapy. The surgeons want to cut me open. And all of them have very good reasons to support what they're offering me. And I'm in the middle, and I don't know what to do. And he was a physician, as I said. His patients called him the saint. They would travel from all over the country to see him. And that's where I learned how powerful hugs can be. He was a great hugger. So he said, Alex, you are Mr. Evidence. I had this PhD or Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford on evidence-based medicine. And I was one of the founders of the Cochrane Collaboration. So he said, OK, that may have some value. <laughs> yeah, my dad would mock me. He said, you are paying too much attention to what you can measure when, in fact, what counts may not be countable. Yeah? Those are the messages from my dad. So he said, do your thing and tell me what would happen to me if I didn't get treatment. So imagine the shock for me, 3,000 miles away. I was already in Canada enjoying all the bountiful opportunities that a country like this can offer. My dad was in South America. And I did my PhD on systematic review. So I was in front of my computer. In fact, I was probably the first physician ever or health professional ever to have the entire National Library of Medicine on CD-ROMs many, 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 many years ago. So by that time, I had the web already started searching. And my dad had lung cancer, and he gave me the, the, the stage. And um, he asked me a very specific question. He said, I would like to be alive, or at least to know, what are my chances to be alive by the time your sister graduates from medicine, because she's nagging me. I searched, and I'm going to fast forward here. I only found one study of somebody with a lung cancer like the one he had with a series of only 16 patients who had not received treatment. Okay. And I had to break the bad news to my dad. I said, Dad, only 16 people from former Yugoslavia. That's the only study I could find. And of those 16, eight were alive the second year with no treatment. Of those eight, four the following year. And then two, and then one, and then zero. That's all we know. Thank you, Alex. I will let you know what I decide. He hung up. He wanted nothing, but my sister put pressure on him. And he ended up getting chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And he may have died as a consequence of the weakening of some blood vessels by the cancer or the radiotherapy, or both. We will never know. And he died at home as he wanted to die. He saw patients that day. Eight came to see him in the morning, and he had oxygen. And he would go to the kitchen to get a bit of oxygen and come back and see the patients. When I went there, I looked at his records by hand, no electronic records. Okay? And the patients were in better shape than he was. Half of them couldn't pay, and he was OK. He was okay with that. 
And um, we mobilized all of the resources of the world to support him. So I would have teleconferences with people at Princess Margaret Hospital here. I would use guidelines that we had developed in Ontario based on the best available evidence. But my father was at the center of the whole thing. And we used email a lot. And I think my relationship with my father became much stronger during those three years that he lasted than ever before. We would find each other in the middle of the night, talking to each other about very, very deep things. And that is inspiring a lot of what I'm going to say here today. And I picked this picture on purpose, because now I am dad. That's my first daughter, Alia. And I want you to imagine how I felt when I took that picture. Not a digital camera. They were not Avail they were not available at that time. I had to go with my thing, look through the hole, and hope for the best. <laughs> so I was there, and honest to God, I felt that my daughter was looking at me. Look at that picture. And I just pressed the button. I said, I hope I can capture it. Okay? And I did. My dad looking at my daughter, my daughter looking at me. And when we developed that, what I felt was a question coming from her. What kind of dad are you going to be? Yeah, what kind of dad are you going to be? So I made the decision to be a loving, supportive, respectful one, and she has turned out quite OK. But last Sunday, a patient of mine sends me a message. And by the way, I've been communicating with patients by email since 1991, despite the system. How many of you are rewarded by your health systems for using email to communicate with patients? Not for the record, John, not a single hand up unless there are some shy people with half a hand okay, up. How many of you can use the telephone to communicate with patients directly? How many of you can get phone calls from patients? OK, that's a little better. We invented the telephone over 100 years ago. So I'm glad that about 5% of the people in this room are using the telephone as part of your practices. Okay? So we have missed about 100 years of the telephone. We have missed about 40 of email. How many of you use Facebook? The usual line I get when I have a radiological test is the doctor will contact you, or you will get the report, or go to your family doctor. And I'm there stressed out. Okay? What's happening to me? For whatever reason, I cannot get an answer there, anywhere. And I ha I'm trying to decode the faces of those professionals who are capturing images from inside my body. And somehow, they have become impenetrable. Tell me, tell me. And I'm a physician. No, I cannot tell you. You're going to get the report, OK? And, and I still don't understand why I couldn't get a, a little hug at that point and say, you're going to be OK. You understand? But anyway, I had a friend calling me the other day saying, one of my best buddies has brain cancer. And this is a colleague of mine from another country. And my buddy, my, my brother, is in Canada. And he's a tough guy, but he's probably facing the toughest period of his life. Has two kids, beautiful wife. He has a brain tumor, no more family. And he's facing the system. Could you please help me help, and help him? On Sunday, and I had lunch with him and with his family at my place with my wife, as my dad would do with his patients when I was growing up because I refused to let the system turn me into a machine. Patients can come to my place as, I, as they used to come and see my dad. I do house calls as my dad used to. And it's incre increasingly difficult to do that. Because as a top specialist, I'm meant to be at the hospital waiting for people to come okay? and process them. So I get this message, and for those of you at the back, it says touching base. You see, June the 3rd. I had my, sim my simulation last Wednesday, he says, but don't have yet a date for the beginning of treatment. 
and I hope to hear as soon as possible about it from Princess Margaret Hospital. We'll let you know, of course, as soon as I will know. You see, we'll let you know, comma, of course. Look, words are like children. The more attention we pay to them, the more demanding they become. I love that, of course. We'll let you know, of course, as soon as I will know. Okay? I'm still waiting for a second opinion about the pathology while planning to get a second opinion on the treatments protocol as well. Hope all will be finalized this coming week. I suggest Ashita, my assistant, whose main job is to protect me from me at work, <laughs> will send me a few alternatives for dinner and we'll take it from there. Once we'll set a date and time, I will make the reservations for a restaurant. I hope you eat all type of food, or do you have any preference? L and HS is love and hugs. So I got a virtual hug, or many hugs, from a patient through email. And that is the purpose of technology for me. Is that, is that my power every time I stand here? No, it's not me, okay? I felt, and for those of you who are going to be watching this at a later point, I can hear some beautiful clinging of glasses and I thought it was <laughs> my steps now, you see? I thought I could be powerful here. I have no power that at home. <laughs> so the illusion has been dispelled. Anyway, love and hugs from a patient by email. So I tend to see that we have two kinds of technologies in the health system now. And I'm oversimplifying. We have diagnostic and therapeutic technologies. We love those. We cannot get enough of them. Give me the latest one, the latest gadget because it makes me feel powerful. I'm going to help more people. So we can find out what's wrong with them and we can fix them. That's what we train to do. That's what I trained to do. 20 years of university. Diagnose and cure. Diagnose and cure. And the more I could diagnose, the more influential I became and the more I could cure, the more prominent I became. And then we have another kind of set of technologies and they are called information and communication technologies, as if they didn't exist. We live in a world full of incredibly sophisticated technology to diagnose and cure, but of incredibly primitive conditions to communicate with each other or with the outside world. So today, I'm here to try to provoke you a little bit. So my friend, patient, now brother, he calls me brother now, which is fascinating. I'm an extension of his friend, brother, physician from his country of origin. Had his initial session this Wednesday and used technology to prepare himself. Videos out there on what to expect with his treatment. And I was there for his first treatment. And they gave me a ride home as they would have done in, in South America in my town if I was practicing there. And I saw him behind the mask and I was there and the radiation uh, um, uh, professionals who were there were wonderful. And he was very upset because a, a paper written stuff said that he needed to take his chemo uh, an hour before radiation. And he had had to wait for one and a half hours because one of the machines had some trouble. And he said, I have been waiting for one and a half hours, and this says that it should be within an hour. And this radiation therapist said, don't worry. The window is from half an hour to two hours. You are OK, with a big smile. It was beautiful to see that. They didn't know who I was. Okay? And then he was anxious about his blood work. And another radiation therapist came and said, don't worry. You don't need to do it. You had one last week. And I would like to come late in the day for my appointments. Okay, we'll, we'll try to figure it out. And you're going to see us, and it's four of us okay, on Wednesdays. So you're going to see the two of us or two others, and hopefully you're going to feel well here because you're going to see your doctor once a month. So it was this radiation therapist who changed the whole experience for him and for me. And what a joy to have had that opportunity the same week when I'm presenting to you. Because what I saw was the power of the high touch there. All of gadgets, lots of gadgets, beautiful computers. Okay? But the most important 
component of that experience this week was that reassurance, was the compassion, was the willingness to listen and to respond to the needs of this family. And I thought I was going to be there to defend them. And I <laughs> left the room with a big chest. I said, isn't my place great? <laughs> Whew. Okay. <laughs> it could have been horrendous. Yeah? And what fell short was the paper. The paper had not been updated. The paper could not be adjusted to the needs of this family. So it was the human component. So I have a big question for you. Because what makes me the happiest or happiest, I'm not sure about the article, it should it be what makes me the happiest or what makes me happiest? Interesting, huh? think about it. What makes me the happiest is not to know. Okay? So I love asking questions. So I'm going to be asking you some questions today. And the first one is, what is our essence? What is that without which we cease to be who we think we are? What's the essence of our profession? Okay. And this is a big question for me. What is my essence as a physician? What is that without which I cannot be called a doctor? Pretty interesting. Because almost every week, I get evidence of things that I thought were essential to my job done by other people. And there are very few people yeah, who could comfortably tell you that they know what is the essence of what they do. So I cannot tell you. I'm trying to find out my essence. So I hope you spend some time trying to figure out yours, because that's what we need to protect at all costs. So I went back in time, because I swear that my dad was a healer with a medical degree. And I'm trying to be a healer myself. And I don't know what that means, but it sounds great and it feels right. I'm trying to heal. I'm trying to be a travel companion for people through life. And when I go back in history, that seems to be the main thing for us. And the high touch was the thing, because we had very few effective interventions. So we had to be compassionate. We had to reassure people. We had to listen. We had to hug. We had to touch. Those were our most powerful tools. And then, you see, very little things changed until the 19th century. Mostly high touch, sometimes deep touch, without anesthesia. Yikes. Yeah? I had dental treatment yesterday, and I was lying there and saying, I cannot imagine how this could have been done 150 years ago. Because in 1846, we had the first visible breakthrough, anesthesia. We could undergo what was going to be horrendous otherwise with no pain. So the end of the, of the 19th century saw a boom in medicine, because that's what we had at the time. Nursing officially happened a few years around that. 1895, yeah. we could see inside ourselves without having to cut ourselves or others. And that gave birth to most of the professions that are here. That gave us physicians very powerful tools. And then antibiotics okay. came and turned us into gods because the main cause of death for humans up to that point had been infections. Yeah. Most of us in this room would have died of an infection of one kind or another. So we, when we suddenly discovered antibiotics, then you could come to me and I was God. I would give you something that would cure you. So with anesthesia, surgery was revolutionized. So we could treat things very aggressively physically. With radiation, we could see inside ourselves, we could diagnose us. And with antibiotics, we could deal with things that couldn't be operated on. Boy, we were powerful. And what was the role of the patient? Minimum. You came to me as a supplicant, and I was God. 
and I would have access to these magic potions or these magic rays, okay? And I would fix you. So the role of the patient became very inferior to the role of the health profession. We took charge. And boy, we enjoyed the ride. My grandfather was a physician too, another maverick. He would jump on parachute to deliver babies in the middle of nowhere. So we entered the era, the era of industrial health because at the time the industrial revolution was evolving. The first car, Henry Ford, showed us how to divide labor and how to optimize our output per time unit with his friend Taylor, who introduced scientific management. So now we could quantify how many products we could get per time unit. And that infected us in the health sector. Now we had managers come and say, how many X are you doing in an hour? How many in a day? And how much are we paying for it? And how can we optimize the process? And what should the outcomes be? And then machines started to become more and more powerful. And somehow we started to become one more type of machine. And our job has been to do what machines cannot do yet. And the power has been taken more and more by managers, administrators, by technologists, by politicians. And somehow our role has been dissolving and dissolving and dissolving, like the person. Because we derived great power and great pleasure from specialization. So we started to know more and more about less and less. And we started to develop specialties by organ, by disease, by system. And we fragmented the human. So we stopped seeing the human, the person. Yeah. So we start talking about the brain tumor in room 14A or the bladder yeah. in the emergency room yeah. or the ulcer on bed 14A. And we were rewarded by the system for doing this. And we became very powerful and very influential. So the 20th century was fantastic for those who loved to diagnose and cure because we had a field day. We discovered a sort of things. We discovered how to fix things. And we fixed a lot. And with the help from public health, sanitation, vaccination, we doubled our life expectancy in most parts of the world in a century. Now we are in the 21st. And we seem to be paying the price for our success during the 20th. Yeah. What is the main cause of death now in the world? Isn't that fascinating? Everybody should be shouting, heart disease! Okay, silence, why? You either don't know or are too shy. 90% of us will die for something related to a chronic disease or more. Not an infectious disease. And even in low-income countries, in the entire world, there are only a few million people who die of infectious diseases more than those that die from chronic conditions. And I don't like the menu. I don't want to have chronic heart failure and have my legs swollen and, and, and my, my lungs full of fluids and not being able to breathe. Okay. Cancer, Canada, number one killer. I look at the menu, I don't like any of the cancers. Which one would I pick? I don't smoke, so probably, hopefully I would not get lung cancer, but that doesn't protect me completely, as you know. So that what, prostate, metastatic, oh. okay. colorectal, Shit, literally. <laughs> Again. I don't like it. And I'm a wimp. Stroke. Have my body paralyzed or aphasic. Alzheimer's. I 
don't like it. And what are we going to do about it? What are we doing about it? And most of us will die in hospitals. And I have data from all over the world, not a lot. But 75% to 80% of people die outside their homes, everywhere in the world. 20% or fewer of us. And most of us will die at home, in our sleep, after a great night of sex <laughs> and a wonderful <laughs> meal without noticing that it happened to us. That's our dream, correct? Who, wouldn't, who would not like to die like that here? OK, there you go. Who would like to die like that here? OK, so there you go. Me too. S sign me in. Okay. So last time I checked, the, life, the, 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 the death rate for humans was 100%. Okay? Even though the articles say, this intervention reduces the mortality rate by 20%. Say, really? Wow. OK? No, it doesn't. It delays death. Or avoids a death from that cause. But it doesn't reduce the mortality rate. The mortality rate is 100%. Okay, so we're going to die. And we are within a system that is causing a lot of suffering. So what can we do to mitigate that suffering? Because now most of the suffering is coming from symptoms. I cannot breathe. I cannot poo. I cannot screw. Okay. <laughs> I cannot sleep. And there is a poem called The Golden Years. And it's like that. I cannot pee, I cannot see, I cannot chew, I cannot screw. The golden years are here. At last, the golden years can kick my ass. That's how the poem goes. So it's not, I'm just quoting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I missed a couple of lines, but you got the essence of it, OK? <laughs> And check it, check it, and tweet it, and share it with other people, because we need to pay attention to what's happening around us. The world has changed outside our institutions, you see, and dramatically. But all we get is more of the same. Mrs. Smith eh, has this problem, and she has a request for this. We are going to provide that. So within our factories, things have not changed very much. The technology has become much more sophisticated. But the actions are very much the same. I continue to be in a cubicle, poof, 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 doing my thing. Division of labor, this is my function. Next, next, next. Yeah. And what's happening around is this. If you hit 65, yeah, your chances of having at least one chronic disease is about 90%. So we were told about this retirement age, beautiful. We are going to okay, suck it up. Because when we hit retirement age, we're going to write all the books we wanted to write. We're going to read all those books we wanted to read. We're going to spend family time with the family. We're going to travel, OK? We're going to relax. When we hit that, most of the time it sucks, OK? <laughs> and it's costing the health system a lot. If you see there, these are data from Medicare in the US. 80% of the money that Medicare is spending is going to people with, listen to that, five or more chronic diseases at the same time. So it's not that I have cancer and I have to cope with cancer. No, I have cancer, I have diabetes, I have high blood pressure, okay? My prostate is a bit big, okay? And I have hemorrhoids, okay? 80% <laughs> of the expenditures of people over the age of 65 goes with that. And it starts early, okay? Because we are not dying of infections anymore, as much as we used to. So those beautiful colors are the tidal wave of chronic diseases that come to get us as we age. So this is from zero to more than 85. And those beautiful colors, OK, is one chronic disease, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, more than eight. And the proportion of people who have them as we age. And I don't like the menu. And my question is, what are we doing about them? How can our tools help us contain this tsunami or mitigate the suffering that is caused by these things? And what is our role in mitigating that? What are we doing about that, is my question. Because we have for sure put more time into our lives. We doubled our life expectancy. But this is what we are producing. 
even in my native Colombia, we are building nursing homes and long-term care facilities as if there is no tomorrow. We want to dump our old, despite the fact that we say we love them. Mom, I will look after you. Yeah, right. How much is it per month? Okay? Everywhere, unfortunately. And I've been to 94 countries. So this is happening everywhere, more in some places than others. Here, it's terrible. For those of you visiting from outside, yeah, we are loving our daughters now, and, but we look at them and say, mm, okay, how much could they cope with us? So we now must make every possible effort to put more life into our years. And then what is our role within our professions to do that? What is our responsibility to do that? Or you just wash your hands and say, my job is just to take that film and send it. Huh? Or to give that dose of radiation. Or to assist during that intervention or magical procedure that is going to unblock that artery. Yeah. And that's my job, that's my contribution. I would say, is that enough? Because yeah. the diagnosed and fixed model is very limited today. So we would have had a better deal by having this conference and by having these professions 30 years ago. We would be celebrating a lot of our achievements. Now our achievements are less and less dramatic. And we are celebrating less and less impressive results. And our studies are trying to squeeze okay, significance and all these incredibly powerful machines are more me too, most of the time. Yeah. And we keep putting most of our money there. So then how can we ensure that we revert the tide a little bit? That instead of having it as our default to do, and that's what my father had, Remember, only 16 cases with his type of cancer with no treatment. We are getting calls, and this article came from the Mayo Clinic of all places, and we need minimally disruptive medicine. How can we bother people less? How can we enable people to adapt as much as possible and to self-manage as much as possible and to consider us as the last resort? Tough because we have most of our rewards at, you see, aligned with doing. Do, 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 as doing more meant better. Okay? So I had the fortune to write uh, the editorial for the British Medical Journal in 2011 for the Christmas issue. And it was entitled, Death Can Be Our Friend. Death Can Be Our Friend. Because we keep denying it. And we live our lives as if we are immortal. So we think we have infinite amounts of time. Okay. And we are doing things to people that we probably wouldn't like others to do to us. So we are violating the first rule. And this was the opening question. Remember, I love asking questions. I cannot help it. The first question in that article was, not phrased like this, it was, would you like to die like your patients do, doctor? And then we said, probably not. How many of you, of you would like to die as your patients are dying? Or how many of you would like to live your lives as most of my, your patients are living their lives now? Because you get to see them all the time with these gowns that I don't know who designed. Okay? We should have a track during the conference on how to redesign fashion in our institutions. Okay? And I would invest in that company. If there is a designer here who would like to recreate Okay, the attire of our institutions, those things suck. We are, we're sadist. Take everything, okay, and put this. And it happened to me the other day. I said, eh. okay, how many people? And then your ass exposed, okay? <laughs> Most of the time, okay? <laughs> and I wasn't posing. I was getting an x-ray that day, and my ass was exposed. And I was told, take everything off. 
And uh, I had that, look at that, fire extinguisher by my side, okay? <laughs> and I really felt as assaulted. Take everything, okay, by very busy people. I knew they cared somehow, but they didn't have time to care. Okay? Next, next, next. And they took it and said, okay, what, what did it show? Well, I cannot tell you anything. I'm a doctor. I cannot tell you anything. Why not? Because that's the policy. Why not? That's the policy. Why is it the policy? I don't know. I said, why don't you know? Leave. I'm too busy, OK? <laughs> so I had to leave. And I spent a fair bit of time in radiology. I could have read my own thing. And I wasn't allowed. And my question is, why not? Whose information is that? Why did I have to wait for a week to know if I had a mass? Like if I had a tumor that was eating one of my ribs because I had a lot of rib pain. Yeah? Or nothing there. Or something in my lungs. I could have done it right there and have a nice conversation with this person and go home quietly or worry. It's my life after all. Yeah? So when are we really needed and for what? Are we entering a post-physician world? And I'm starting to talk from my perspective. Because the more I look at you, the more I realize that you are eating away things that used to be within our camp, the physician's camp. Yeah? The physician will see you once a month. And yet, every week, these radiation therapists are seeing the patients. Yeah? My daughter, one, my youngest daughter, was admitted to hospital the other day. And um, she was there for three or four days. I would sleep by her side. The nurses were the main providers of care. The physicians came five minutes when we were lucky and disappeared. So I really don't know what my essence is. Okay? And the more I look at this or that, I realize that other people could do that better than I could because nobody trained me for that. Okay? So now we have this thing called the green technologies. Green, Colombian, Spanish, green, not green, green. One of the most difficult things for me was to realize that there were different E sounds in English. So I would say shit when I needed a piece of paper. Okay? <laughs> okay? I hope you don't throw, you, you are not going to, to escort me out of the stage. I'm saying this, okay, but they seem to be enjoying it. So, <laughs> okay. So this green stands for genomics, robotics, infonomics or informatics, and nanotechnologies. We are putting most of our research eggs in that basket, hoping to squeeze immortality out of the mix, because we are terrified by our deaths. And most of the decision makers in the granting agencies are old now, mostly men with prostate problems, I bet. Okay? No gender equity most of the time there. Yeah? Like with caregiving, not a lot of gender equity there. Yeah? So we are putting a lot of money into these technologies, hoping to live forever and to conquer all these diseases. So we want to conquer cancer. We want to conquer Alzheimer's. We want to conquer strokes. We want to eliminate okay, all these diseases. And that's OK. I think that's a very worthy cause. My question is, how are we distributing our resources to make sure we are not suffering unnecessarily while we get there? Yeah. So I'm going to give you some examples of, of what's happening from my perspective as a physician uh, who is immersed in the world of technology. Yeah. And this was an article in The Economist, one of my main sources of knowledge. Too many journals, journalists are doing a much better job at synthesizing medical research <laughs> yeah. than most of our colleagues. We still keep publishing in these boring, impenetrable journals that guide our careers. Citation impact factor. I don't know what's the highest in your fields. What is it? Two? Three? Four? What's the highest citation impact? Do you even care about citation impact factors? Well, in medicine, we care a lot. Okay. 
and I think for the Canadian Medical Association Journal, maybe five or six. That means that only six people cite your work within two years after publication of the article. That's how we measure our importance. So I learned a lot from the economist. Okay? And there was an article there on the 2nd of June of 2012 that said, squeezing out the doctor, the future of medicine. I don't get these articles in my medical journals. I can tell you that often. So they said the role of physicians at the center of healthcare is under pressure. Wow, okay. So I said, good time, because I am already there. <laughs> and we had developed what we call the staircase of support. I've been devoting my life to supporting people. The main things I prescribe are hugs and information. I'm a listener. I'm a listener. I'm a hugger. And we have realized that along this staircase, our institution should be the last resort, not the default. And that we should make every possible effort to support people wherever they are, to eliminate their suffering, transcending as many boundaries as possible. And that's what I do with eHealth. How can we use the high tech to boost the high touch, not the other way around? The high tech at the service of the high touch. So what can we do in terms of self-help? Okay. How can we enable ourselves to make as many decisions by ourselves as possible? And when we cannot do it alone, then how about relying on our peers? Other people have had the same. Then groups. Then the community, our neighborhoods. I remember growing up, everybody knew yeah, that my dad had lung cancer, the doctor is ill, and the entire community would be mobilized to support him and his family primary care there, and then our institutions, ideally institutions without walls, where we could be part of an ecosystem communicating with the rest of the world, not in a bunker. We go there, the rest of the world disappears. Next, 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 next. I don't have time to talk to you. Next, next, I will not phone you. Next, next, don't phone me, don't even try, okay? Don't email me, I don't exist, boom, boom, boom. Next, next. Next, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I cannot have, oh my God, I want to retire soon, okay? They are pushing the retirement age, holy shit, blah, blah. okay, all those things, okay? We need to move away from that and figure out ways in which we can drive ourselves out of business. And could we imagine a world in which we are not needed? And how far could we push the envelope? And that's what I'm doing. And look at this, there is an iPhone application that allows pregnant ladies to do the ultrasound by themselves. <laughs> and listen to the heartbeats and all that. An iPhone application. I was, oh my God, they, how could they know? And all that stuff, correct? And they just start saying, hmm, I didn't know about this. And then I learned. I wasn't born knowing this. How far could they push it as members of the public? Okay. How much could they fill the gaps that we are leaving open? And there is something called patients like me. And look at what the statement that they have there. And I'm, I'm part of that social network too. Because I hope there will be physicians like me with whom I could talk about these things. But this is a place where you can find people like you. And there are 152,154 patients with more than 1,000 conditions talking to each other. And they're writing papers and publish, publishing them in journals of much greater impact than most of ours, where we get our stuff published. Because you can be a patient and a statistician, and you can be a patient and a physician, and a radiation therapist, and a clinical oncologist. The word patient can come into our lives too. Okay? So what they do is use technology to learn about how to protect themselves. And this is on deep brain stimulation treatment, for example. And there are, in that particular case, 178 people with, with Parkinson's disease. Okay? And they have what is deep brain stimulation, individual patient evaluations they have there. And they have the patient evaluations on the other side, so you can find people like you who are going through the same thing with whom you could connect and their families to understand what's going on, because we don't have a clue. We are the next, next. Our interactions are episodic, brief, episodic, like pictures. Our lives are made of pictures, but of many people, without the continuity. For them, life is a continuum. 
And look at this, side effects. And you can dig and dig and dig commonly reported side effect conditions and hospitalizations associated with deep brain stimulation. 19 in hospitalization. Okay? That was the, 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 the why patients stopped having deep brain stimulation, not indicated, 84, didn't seem to work for. And they are putting their own data there where we are erecting walls in our institutions because the information, accessing their own information. Oh my God, they are going to hurt themselves. Okay? Very patronizing or matronizing. Take your pick. So they are doing it. They are using technology to overcome okay, the limitations that we have created for them. And they are not prepared to wait. And then other things start happening. Boom. Image recognition software. If I'm on Facebook and there is a picture, it already figures out who that person is and suggests whether I want to tag that person or not, this thing. Google can do the same thing. You have a picture, boom, boom, found searching. Imagine that applied for our imaging. And saying this is, okay, the image of, okay. So what's our role? Okay. What's our role? I can take the picture and I can use image recognition software to diagnose it. And it's coming, okay, it's coming. Whatever you're doing or I am doing, you are doing or I am doing because machines cannot do them yet. Yeah. 2006, first example of robot surgery by itself. This thing was able to go and find the focus of arrhythmia in the person's heart and ablated it by itself. And it learned from 10,000 previous cases how to do it alone, yeah, without our intervention, was able to diagnose and treat. 2006, what do you say? Holy shit, correct? Oh my God, oh my God, or it's not going to happen to me, or in my country it will not happen, with that's too far, that's science fiction. Okay, I can see the arm there in the middle, hmm, okay. I'm an anesthesiologist, one of my backgrounds. Now there is this Max Lippi, created at McGill University, Max Lippi. This machine can give anesthesia, I'm not needed there. So one anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthesiologist will be looking after 10, 20 cases and this machine will be providing the anesthesia. No anesthesiologist in the room unless he or she is needed. And now we have this notion of theranostics, because one of the problems of imaging was that it was diagnostic, but not therapeutic. So it was halfway through. Never the complete real deal. Somebody else had to make the decisions about what to do and do it. Now there is this marriage of therapy and diagnostics, theranostics. And you're going to be hearing more and more and more this term in your fields. Now we can only figure out what happens. We can cure people. Okay? And this is an example of molecular imaging and radiotherapy. So this thing goes into cancer cells, okay, and can deliver treatment there. But you see the treatment work. Okay? My question is, is the patient disappearing again? When we had the urge to look at the person again because we are in this mess of chronic diseases that we cannot cure all these symptoms, the opportunity may be dissipating again because technology is coming to tell us that we don't need the patient again. Are we disappearing too? And I remember the 1966 movie, uh, um, Fantastic Voyage. I don't know how many of you, how many of you don't even know what I'm talking about here in this room? It's getting increasingly scary. Huh? But those things that you can see on top of that finger is a robot that can deliver medication, that can diagnose from the inside. And this is not science fiction anymore. This thing can crawl inside your arteries or inside your gut take pictures and deliver medication, that kind of things. That other thing, 200 okay, microns, that thing can deliver treatment. And those uh, arms can fold and target things at the microscopic level. So are we disappearing too? Who are we? What's our role? And then there is this recent development. This is a May 2012 report 
and there is a device of augmented reality that is being designed for astronauts. Astronauts cannot diagnose and cure. They are not physicians. You cannot have a specialist of everything, a radiologist or a technologist. Like they are there in a capsule, few of them. So now the idea is to use augmented reality so they can diagnose on the spot and treat with no training at all. And as Velcro came from that kind of work, and Teflon, who said that we couldn't have DIY okay, theranostics soon? And one of my heroes when I was growing up was Dr. McCoy. I knew that if the character had a name, that character would survive. If not, toast. Okay? But it was an intergalactic wireless theranostics device. And then the new generations of Star Trek brought those things. So this was a dream. This was science fiction. Well, I got an invitation to join a panel to judge a real tricorder. And there is a bounty of $10 million. Okay? And there are groups all over the world developing a tool that you will hold in your hand that would diagnose and treat without health professionals. Big conditions. Disruptive innovation, a competition to change a broken healthcare system. So what's our role? What's our role? Are we in an era of change or are we in a change of era? And I believe more and more that we are in a change of era. The game is changing and very quickly. And we are stuck in the 20th century with fancier machines. But our brains, our minds, our souls are stuck in the era in which diagnosing and fixing and becoming more and more specialized continues to rule. So I want to introduce you now to my grandfather, and I'm finishing. When I was accepted into medical school, I came, Grandpa, 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 I made it. He said, hold it, hold it, hold it. I wanted to be Dr. McCoy, remember. He said, you need to temper your expectations, Alex. I don't know who said this, but this is what this is all about. You need to understand this. Please don't forget. Okay? Your business will be to cure sometimes, okay? to alleviate often, but to console always. And I said, yes, but Grandpa, Grandpa. I hugged him. I ran to tell somebody else. Then this beautiful man developed arthritis, Parkinson's, had a stroke. And I spent the next 15 years trying to keep him alive. I forgot to console him. I never asked him what made, made him happy, if he had regrets. How could I help him deal with the problem? So now I'm aligning myself with a different kind of crowd. How can we enhance the high touch with technology? And there are not many people left, I can tell you. The attraction is with curing and diagnosing and, and fixing and fixing and fixing. So this is an application for those who want to talk about the end of life and those who don't, okay? with interactive plans to prepare, to have advanced directives, to make sure that we are prepared for what is inevitable. And this is what justifies the effort. I got a message at 2.14 this morning. And this is from my friend, the physician, in another country who put me in touch with this patient who was treated on Wednesday. And he says, Alex, I can feel it. Look at this. I can feel the blood flowing in our interconnected vasculature. But it is more than that. It is a soul connection. Listen to that. It is a soul connection. Thank you so much for being there for me, for the patient. It is so great to love somebody to the extent you feel him to be part of you. Thanks for being there. And when I received it this morning, I said, I have to share it with you. Because this encapsulates what I'm trying to transmit with insufficiently powerful words coming from me. This is my life now. And nothing or nobody would prevent me from continuing going on this path. So I want to leave you with a big one, which is a, a, the wish for the future of your professions. A wish for the future of your lives. Because that's what we're investing, day in and day out, our lives. If you found Aladdin's lamp 
and had the opportunity to ask for one wish, what would it wish? What would it be? I'll tell you which is mine. That we start paying more attention to a wellness system. Not so much to a healthcare system. This is my wife, my two daughters, and me. And every time we can, we go to one of these monuments to human arrogance, point our asses at them, and say, fuck you! Again. Again. Because the risk is that we start believing our own press, that we can conquer death, that we're going to live forever, that we are powerful, that we can control the uncontrollable that we can prevent the inevitable. So this is the kind of questions I'm asking now. What makes you happiest? What's your verb? Mine is to question, to wonder. And look, here I am, asking questions. What is your verb? What is your verb? Rebecca, you told me already. To explore, huh? And what makes her happiest is adventure. Yeah? Beautiful. How can I contribute to that? How could you do as much of that with no regrets? Because now I'm increasingly a regret manager. People come to me and say, if only, if only. Mercedes Lackey said those are the two most painful words in the language, the two cruelest words, if only. If only I had done that, if only I hadn't done that. So how could we ensure that anyone else could do the same? And what kind of services do we need to create? And what kind of roles do we need to develop to ensure that we do that, even if it is during a few seconds? So next time you see a patient say, hey, what makes you happiest? What is your verb? Are you doing it or not? Okay. How can I help you do that? The world will be a better place. And at the end, with all these gadgets, I hope we can build a no-sphere or a new sphere. And this is something that Teilhard de Chardin, a Jesuit, who couldn't write this when he was alive, published this when he was alive because the Pope would prevent him from doing that. He said, the day will come when after harnessing space, the winds, the tides, gravitation, we shall harness the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, we will have discovered fire. This is my invitation to you. You have more interactions with many patients and most other people, especially if they're dealing with chronic conditions. They're going to be scared, suffering, confused. Make sure that every interaction, no matter how short, becomes a source of joy. Thank you very much. Big hug. Thank you, Alex. You're an inspiration. And you know, I've heard about high touch for years. And I've heard about the highest standard of patient care for years. And I've often struggled to understand what does that really mean? And it's so refreshing to know that it's very simple. It just comes down to a hug. Thank you so much. That's a half hug. I want the full one. <laughs> okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you as a part of this conference. Before you leave uh, for refreshments in the exhibit hall, I have just a few announcements, so bear with me. We have a new session today that's not in the program. Uh, it's at uh, 3.30 in the Dominion Ballroom North, Image Interpretation, Essential Knowledge and Skills, presented by Marianne Hardy and Beth Snaith, both from the United Kingdom. I also want to remind you that if you're a speaker for this afternoon, Saturday and Sunday programs are requested to be uploaded as soon as possible in the VIP room on the concourse level. However, if you're speaking this morning, please take your presentation with you and we'll load it in the room. There are also tickets available for the dance following the President's Gala, and those are only $15 plus tax. You can get those at the registration desk. 
Also, on Saturday at 4 p.m., uh, the session titled AIEC Virtual Classroom, a Global Reality, has been canceled, and it's being replaced by Scanning in Uganda, a sonographer's journey from Toronto to Uganda to teach practical ult ultrasound scanning. And that's by Carol LaDuc. Two more things. Uh, the CAMRT Inclusion and Diversity Initiative, you're invited to a lunchtime gathering during the CAMRT Annual General Conference and the ISRRT World Congress, and that's on Saturday at 12.15. Lunch will be served, and it's in the Simcoe and Dufferin uh, room on the second level. You can join your college, colleagues to discuss what can be done by you, your workplace, and other professionals to enhance the involvement of all members. This session will include a diversity and inclusion healthcare presentation by Lori Boyd, Director of Policy at the College of Medicine Radiation Technologists of Ontario here in uh, Toronto. And finally, uh, the CAMRT Foundation Raffle. President Amanda Boulderston invites conference delegates to join her for cocktails and to support the Foundation Raffle. There is no charge to attend the event. That's Saturday at 6 p.m. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>